reminded me of that. You're good. Hi. How you guys doing? There's nearly 12 of you. That's awesome. Um, all right, so I realize that I'm the last talk uh, between now and beers, so I'll try to be, you know, quick without being too terse on, on some of the things. So my talk is called Design is Free. I was really hoping for, you know, a massive turnout. Like, what do you mean design is free? How many designers in the room? Raise your hand if you're a designer. Fantastic. Okay, so design's free, and you'll have to stop charging for what you do now. That's okay. We'll talk about this. All right. Um, I always like to start with a story. Uh, this is one of my favorite stories. Um, most of it's true. Uh, most of it happened to me. Um, not all of it, though. But let's talk about this. So I, um, I took my daughters to Disneyland. If you, uh, if you have kids, please raise your hand. Okay. All right. So for those of you who don't have kids, uh, if you were a kid, raise your hand at one time. Okay, good. All right, so I took my daughters uh, and wife to Disneyland. We drove down from Oakland, California, down to Anaheim, and we, uh, I made several mistakes in the context of this trip. Uh, one of my first mistakes was uh, deciding to go to Disneyland on Christmas Day. I thought it was going to be empty, but it was like a zoo. It was massively populated. It was, I mean, the lines were completely out of control. I thought everyone would be home celebrating Christmas, but they were all celebrating Christmas at Disneyland. It was nuts. Uh, the second mistake I made w was uh, we drove down the night before. I figured, well, let the kids get some sleep. You know, we'll take turns driving and get some sleep. My wife and I could sort of drive down and tag team the driving. Uh, and, and as it turns out, they were so excited. My kids were so excited that they absolutely didn't sleep. So, you know, up every like 20, 25 minutes, stopping for snacks, go to the bathroom. And so everyone, we all arrived and we were exhausted and it was a zoo. So we get there and we do a couple of rides and we stop into one of the, uh, the hotels and we go into the lobby and get some ice cream from one of the ice cream parlors in, in, in this lobby of this hotel. And the first thing that happens is uh, my six-year-old, she was five at the time, uh, the little one drops her ice cream cone on the ground. Now, if this has ever happened to you, with, either with kids or, or as a kid, okay. So um, it was the worst tragedy that had ever befallen her. She was completely nonplussed. She was freaking out. And she, she did one of those, um, uh, you know, when kids get really, really upset, and they, they're going to cry, and they're going to freak out any minute, but they do this, like, silent cry. They just sort of open their mouth, and nothing comes out for a couple seconds. That's when I knew it was going to be bad. So she drops the ice cream cone on the ground in the lobby of this hotel. And, uh, you know, the 8-year-old, 7 at the time, starts to make fun of her for having done this. Uh, I feel kind of bad because I'm out 35 bucks, and now I've got to, you know, calm my, my five-year-old down and, and get her to relax and stop the other one from giving her a hard time. And my wife, you know, begins to sort of dutifully look around for how she can help to clean up the mess. And something really cool happens, okay? And the thing that's really cool that happens, uh, let me preface it by saying that uh, Disney has a principle, and the principle they, they follow is that Disney is the happiest place on earth, okay? And so, you know, okay, I sort of knew this going in, but, but uh, this is what happened. A housekeeper comes walking across the lobby, and I thought, oh, great, you know, she'll help to clean this up. Uh, and instead what happens is she says, come with me. And she takes us into the ice cream shop. Okay? She exchanges some words with the woman behind the counter. A new ice cream cone, just like the one on the ground, appears. Uh, I reach into my pocket to hand them another $35, and they're like, no, no, no. You know, it's no charge. It's all good. The ice cream cone gets handed to my daughter. She stops crying because, you know, the tragedy's over for her. The, the older one has nothing to make fun of her anymore. None of us had to clean anything up. And as a matter of fact, we exit the shop and we go out, and, and someone else literally had cleaned up the mess already. Um, I use this story to illustrate the, the quality and the depth with which Disney thinks about the user experience. And I also talk about this as, as this idea that it's everyone's job if you work at Disney, to make everyone's experience at Disney the best possible experience that they can have at all. And I was, I, I mean, I was, it was amazing. Uh, the lines were still long, it was still a long day, we're still super tired, but this sort of made my day. It was really, really nice. All right, so let me give you a little background on myself. 
now that you've had the sort of the personal intro, let me give you the, the professional one. Uh, when I went to school, uh, I went to school in uh, uh, the very late 80s, uh, and I went to school uh, uh, originally to study graphic design, which I did, and I discovered industrial design my first year. I went to art school, uh, wandered upstairs one day, and they were doing uh, making product. So I took a couple of elective classes, switched over, uh, and eventually walked out with my degree in industrial design. Um, uh, and, and that was fine. That was great. It was a, a, a great and fun program, and I was super happy to have it. Um, I have uh, since, uh, when I, I moved to Silicon Valley in 1994, uh, the web was just starting to happen. And to me, the web uh, uh, was sort of the best marriage between industrial and graphic design. So at that time, I viewed source, and I learned HTML. Uh, and then this is sort of my trajectory. Um, I was doing sort of uh, early on whatever projects I could sort of pick up. Right, so each of those dots represents a sort of a startup that I was at. Uh, that uh, S2 startup got bought by Amazon. That was pretty exciting. Okay, all the other S, uh, S's on there, all the other startups have failed. Uh, most startups fail. It's just true. Um, not that you can't learn anything for, by being at one, but um, uh, most startups fail. So I'd been at you know five, six startups. Uh, tried to start my own, and then this is my trajectory. I'm currently at McKinsey. Um, I started off at McKinsey as a consultant. Okay, uh, doing work for clients in uh, bespoke fashion. I'm currently the head of New Ventures. New Ventures is a division that is responsible for all the software that we produce as a company. Uh, this software is used uh, by both our clients and our consultants. And my job is to build a design team. It's to build a design system to, again, apply to all of these different and various pieces of software that we've got uh, to make things generally easy and, and more well designed from that perspective. And so that's where I'm at. But I've worked uh, either for all these companies directly or uh, through Frog, uh, many of these other companies, and you might recognize some of those. Uh, I've designed primarily for the screen most of my career. Frog Design, I got to work on some physical product like this, uh, 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 this espresso maker from a company called Villaware. Uh, it was part of a suite of uh, five appliances that we worked on for, for that company, but mostly screen-based design work. So I started off doing you know, websites, and then it was e-commerce sites as uh, the web became a little bit more uh, substantial. Then it was uh, web-based applications. Then it was client applications mixed in with you know, the very preliminary mobile stuff and mobile screens and all kinds of apps, even embedded interfaces on, on devices. I've done some of those as well. And that is generally my background. Um, so what are we here to talk about today? So today we're talking about uh, uh, the, the fact that the tactical aspects of design okay, are approaching free. Okay, they're not totally free yet, but they're approaching free. And with the advent of digital distribution, commodification, uh, automation, and globalization, all right, this is sort of why that's happening. Um, so we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about what we can do about it. Um, there was a lot in there. I'm going to unpack it first and sort of talk about specifically uh, what I mean by all of those terms. Uh, but you also might be saying sort of what the fuck are you talking about? You know, design isn't free. I get paid to design all the time. Um, so again, it's the tactical aspects of design. But let's start with uh, sort of a definition of design. So um, uh, I always uh, uh, bring out this definition. This is uh, Ray Eames of Charles and Ray Eames. Anybody familiar? Anybody not familiar with the Eameses? One person. Okay, cool. A couple people. Uh, they, uh, they did a lot of work in the 50s and 60s. Uh, there's a, a, a movie called Powers of Ten. You can look up on Google. It's just amazing and lovely. Uh, they designed things like this chair. They basically lived and breathed design, and they were a couple. Uh, and so they, it was sort of unusual that they were working together. I always picture Ray because uh, men sort of get uh, uh, a lot of play. Anyway, so uh, uh, definition of design that I like to use is that it's uh, one could describe design as a plan for the arrangement of elements to accomplish a particular purpose. That's really super broad, All right, but it's true, okay? And so what I like to say is that uh, design is sort of a lot of different things. It's, it's product design, it's service design, uh, architecture, graphic design, um, automotive design. You can design cars if you were inclined. You can design games. Um, but we're, we're literally, right now, sitting in a designed environment. Everything is designed, right? The chairs that you're sitting in were designed. Uh, the lighting and the way these, the equipment sits on my head is all designed. 
uh, your clothing was designed by somebody. Everything that we basically do, unless you're going to go live like in the top of a tree someplace in the middle of a forest, has been designed. Okay. So um, I like to describe uh, design in terms of its complexity. Okay. So I use this model. Uh, this model was developed by uh, Stephanie DeRusso. Uh, she, at the time, was a PhD student down in, uh, in Australia. But I like to talk about uh, uh, complexity as it exists at the lowest level, right? The sort of the tactical uh, and the object level design. And then moving up the pyramid, we'll talk about this in a little bit. Uh, I also unpack this, uh, this model uh, to describe how uh, companies can be more uh, conscious of design and talk about that, but not in this talk. Okay, if, if that comes up, we'll sort of talk about it. So at the object level, the artifact level, there's the things, the very specific things that you can design, like a chair uh, or a graphic or a logo or a website. And when I talk about design being free, those are the kinds of things that I'm, I'm talking about. And, when, and free, approaching free, okay? Not totally free yet, okay? So what do I mean when I say digital distribution? Um, well, it's, it's, it's a, a big topic, but let's talk about the free part first. Uh, this is Chris Anderson. Uh, you might remember her, his work uh, 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 at Wired. Uh, you know, he was responsible for a number of different things, like the long tail is his concept. And then he wrote this book. Has anyone read Free? Okay, so this is a great book. Please read it by all means. Uh, he talks a lot about how in the digital economy, with digital distribution, you end up with uh, these things, all right, and because things can be distributed digitally, uh, they tend to approach a level of of, uh, um, of cost or a level of, of cost to the users as, you know, de minimis, relatively small, okay? Um, but that what happens is is that you, you attach sort of a freemium uh, aspect of things. You say, look, we're going to char uh, start charging you for the more strategic work, and that's a gist of, of what we're talking about today. But for example, okay, um, recorded music. So uh, I can go back in history, uh, sort of uh, 1969 is when I was born. Uh, the first vinyl album that I stole from my sister and brother was uh, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Go Band by the Beatles. And uh, I had a record collection. It was, you know, got to be about a hun couple hundred maybe, maybe tops albums. Uh, then I bought cassettes and then I bought uh, CDs. Uh, I don't want to talk about the amount of money I've wasted over, over the course of my life on these hard media buys. Um, but this chart describes essentially, you know, uh, um, the, the, the rise and fall of each of these media to describe, um, you know, what happened to what's going on with the record industry and what's going on with distribution. So with digital distribution and even with digital distribution, right? I, I've got digital listed there, and at a certain point, I, I converted all of my uh, CDs, like I had uh, 300 CDs at the time, to MP3s. I sat and I just like ripped them all into iTunes, and then managing my library was sort of a full-time job, uh, but I did it, right? And at this point, I've stepped completely away from having any sort of media like that, right? I use either Spotify or Pandora uh, or Apple Music, and I just sort of listen to whatever is available, and it's become sort of this personalized radio that... I don't have to have any music anymore per se. Okay, same with the record. Sorry, same with the newspaper industry. Um, um, newspaper industry is sort of going through its its uh, a version of this. So, uh, with the digital distribution of news, you no longer have to have a print version of necessarily a newspaper in order to get the news, and therefore you see the same sort of a chart as it relates to the newspaper industry. And, and I had direct experience with this. I worked, um, uh, at the time it was called Tribune Interactive. This is uh, while I was at Frog Design, one of my last projects there. Uh, it has since been rebranded to Trunk. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this. It's interesting. I'm not sure where they came up with that. Uh, they have subsequently sold the LA Times to uh, some investor. So they sold it out from Trunk into uh, into some other person's private hands. But the, the, at the time, they were freaking out. They didn't quite know what to do. So we tried to give them a redesign. We tried to uh, introduce some new concepts to them. And they were very married to their old concepts. And subsequently, uh, they started to decline as well. And in large part because of how classifieds were working as well and the advertising and everything else. I mean, I pick up a, and this is the same as true for magazines, like I pick up a Wired magazine, and Wired magazine when I was, you know, 1995, 96, 97, was like thick, right? And it was thick because it had a lot of ads in it, and it does, doesn't have that many ads in it anymore, 
Uh, it's really hard to sell into, into uh, print. So that's what's happening with that. Um, this gentleman is, is starting to talk about uh, don't go pay for college. Hack your education. Okay, This is a really interesting book to read. Um, and a, a lot of the reasons for that is that uh, you can go online and you can learn a ton of things. So uh, uh, I have a, a gentleman who works uh, with us at, at McKinsey. And I asked him, so, you know, um, where'd, you learn, where'd you learn your design? He goes, oh, I, I learned it at YouTube. I said, oh, fantastic. Do you know so-and-so and so-and-so? I knew several people who worked there. And he goes, no, 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 I, I learned design from watching YouTube videos. I said, oh, okay, cool. Fantastic. So he learned literally how to like uh, run around with Illustrator and Photoshop and he learned it from watching YouTube. Um, but the same is true of a number of other aspects of, of learning and sort of the digital distribution of, of online material. So uh, this is a, an app called Master, a, a service called Master Class. And I can go take a class with Jane Goodall if I wanted to understand uh, chimpanzees. I can uh, understand photography with a class from Annie Leibovitz. I can understand uh, architecture and design from Frank Geary, and I can do this for about you know 250 bucks. That's pretty amazing. Um, I might have to spend 250 bucks just to hear them lecture in any one given instance, but this material is available to me as a package. I can hear all of them in you know a couple of dozen others, three or four dozen others, for the same 350 bucks. So this notion of approaching free, right? It's just coming coming way way down. Okay, um, here's another example. Uh, you know, you're learning stuff, and it's all you can learn um, about design, and you can go do that from from our friend here. Um, uh, you know, I can't speak to the quality of this material. I haven't taken any of these classes, uh, but he's a bright guy. I've met him, and he knows a lot of what he's talking about. Um, and then, you know, you start to look around at the different things that are uh, essentially available to you, and I can go learn languages from Duolingo. Um, or literally almost any of these other sorts of things is all relatively free to me. Um, in some cases, it might cost a little bit of money, but I can get uh, a really good education just from looking around at this different free material. This ends up being very positive for everyone in the room, so just keep this in mind as we move forward. Let's talk about commodification. Okay. Um, when I learned how to do stuff on the web, it was view source. Right? I had no idea you know, how to code up that thing that I saw that was really cool. So I'd view source, I'd check it out, and then I would try it myself and see if I could do it. And, you know, a little bit of hacking got me there, okay? Uh, later, right, after 1994, 95, I started to meet others who uh, had the knowledge, and we started to get together and do, like, meetups and things, and, and that was sort of my early education. Subsequently, okay, um, I went and found a number of other things that, that were online as they started to sort of come up, things like lynda.com, which I'll mention later in the talk, uh, but, you know, other sort of things. And then, you know, r relatively, uh, maybe a lot, I don't know how long ago I, I noticed this, but uh, it, it became very, very clear that uh, uh, a lot of the design tools that we use on a regular basis are also essentially approaching free. So if I do a, a, a search on Google for free design tools, I get a, a, a 856 million results. Now, let's say a lot of those are terrible. Like, let's say there are a lot of garbage results in there and a very small percentage is, is good, let's say 10,000 are good results. Uh, that's still 10,000 choices, and I'm, my, I probably wouldn't be able to plow through them all. Um, so there's that. And so uh, I can go to 99designs and get a uh, resource to help me out to do a particular project, okay? And there's plenty of them, okay? And happy to do it. Um, and the costs are a lot less than what I might pay in San Francisco for, for the, same, uh, the same people. I can go to Squarespace. I never have to design a website for myself again. I can just go to Squarespace, and it's pretty DIY. It's really super simple. Allows me to just like crank out a website. Um, I uh, well, uh, I don't use that many different fonts, honestly. Right? I I've used you know maybe a tried and true 15 or 16 fonts over the course of my career, dabbling in some others. But um, whatever free font you want is pretty much available. Right? It's just, tons and tons of fonts available. So, you know, fonts are relatively free. Uh, you know, now that Sketch is out, all right, not only is it a less expensive tool than, let's say, the Adobe suite, um, but it also has a number of plugins. And a lot of those plugins are free, right? Um, you know, people just want to be part, sort of part of the system. And then building on that and moving up, you start to talk about how um, material, 
Uh, Material is a design language from Google, also essentially a design system. Uh, they just came out with themes, and my contention is is that uh, Material Themes is you know just as much a product as Gmail or Search in the Google universe, and it's free, right? So I can go get uh, um, all of the sort of the UI elements that I might need using um, using themes, and I can go you know build my website, and I've got sort of almost everything I need. Uh, icons. I will never have to design another icon necessarily. Um, it's just not, you know, really, really super important they do this. I, at Frog, uh, there was a guy named Matt Bice, great designer, and all he would do was design icons because he was just a really good designer designing icons. So whenever there's a project came up and we ended up meeting icons, we'd go to Matt and we'd say, hey, we need, you know, icons for this project. He got a little tired of it after a while, but for the most part, he was the icon guy. Um, but that's just not true anymore. I can go get a billion icons and I never have to design another icon. Or, you know, if you're going to be d designing and developing your own system, you might want to develop your own icons, but I wouldn't do it first. So there's that. So it used to be that you had to pick two from the diagram on your left. All right, good, fast, and cheap. And you'd pick two. You'd say, well, good and fast. Great, they're not going to be cheap. Okay? Or you'd say, I want it cheap and fast. Well, it ain't going to be good. Okay? And I, I don't know if this is true anymore. What I think is happening is there's a bit of a convergence where I can start to get some of all three in that little middle piece. And it's because these tools are coming down in price. Way. But there's another aspect to this notion of, of free, and that aspect is automation. Okay? Uh, I'm not going to dig too deep into this chart. Um, I, I uh, picked it off of one of my McKinsey uh, 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 sites, and it basically describes the idea that there are certain uh, skills that um, are a little bit higher in demand, but, but they are, um, uh, if you are on the manual side of things, okay, if you are doing stuff that's uh, uh, a lower uh, cognitive, uh, that you're going to get automated out of your job. Um, but there's going to be automation at the higher levels as well, and I've got some examples. So we talked about doing websites. Uh, this idea of the grid, if you've not heard of this, the grid is you just give them your content and they will pretty much have a little AI design a site for you. And that's interesting. Uh, probably see a lot more of that coming up. Here's a woman, uh, Taryn Southern. I don't know who she is, but I found her in a search. Uh, I'm not sure she's not herself a bot. Um, but what she did was she released an album. Uh, her album is called uh, I Am AI. And uh, a lot of the work that was done to develop the album using, you know, Watson, Amper Music, uh, uh, Google's Magenta, and I don't know what the last one is, that acronym AIVA, uh, you know, were the record producers. Was the production was done um, essentially by AI. And that's really interesting. So here's a... a um, you know, what I think of as a higher cognitive skill set being applied to something like music. Okay? So, some stats. Um, if you are uh, in uh, Poland, as we are today, or the U.S. or India, okay, you might be a little bit of, a, at risk uh, of having your, your BPO job outsourced by automation. All right? And so there's going to be an amount of that. Okay, so for every four jobs lost, there's one new sort of automation management position, which is a positive thing, right? It means that there's a job sort of managing the automation bit. Um, and then, of course, you know, outsourcing is, is a big thing. I'll talk about that in a minute. But, you know, to use one of these tools, right, I picked a tool and I said, all right, let me get a free logo here. Let me see what this is like. And I can't really say that the quality is super awesome, okay? But I gave it some parameters in the tool, okay? And I said, hey, uh, this is my tagline, and this is generally what I think might look good or whatever. I gave it some color choices. And this is what it gave back to me, right? It's not the worst in the world, okay? Um, specifically, it's not the worst in the world when you consider how Amazon started, all right? So uh, this is a progression of Amazon's logos until they got to the smile, the A to Z smile, which I actually witnessed. So. When I worked at Amazon, because we got bought, uh, I was at Alexa Internet, and we got bought by Amazon in 99, uh, and then I spent another year at Amazon. Uh, on my stock certificates, uh, which ended up being worth uh, a little bit of money, I was a thousandaire on paper for about 10 minutes, um, that was the logo 
that was on my stock certificate, that first one up there, it's horrible, right? Uh, I would even posit that the ones that I just showed are a little bit better than that, and that's okay. Um, Bezos simply decided not to prioritize between 1995 and, well, I guess 1998, right, a really sharp-looking logo. And then even when they went to do their redesigns and they went through a couple of iterations of it, uh, they were getting to the smile. And the smile happened to be the, the best one. It's what they have today. Uh, but it took him a little while to get there, but he, he, he decided specifically not to prioritize it. So he started up Amazon. It's worth a lot of money today. And the fact is, is that uh, the logo wasn't super, super critical to him. And we've seen examples of, um, of algorithms doing design work. So this is uh, MIT's former logo. Uh, it's since been redesigned by, I believe, Pentagram. Uh, but this was beautiful work. It was really, really interesting. Um, and it was a, an algorithm saying uh, your, your basic configuration of a logo can be this, this, or this uh, in hundreds and hundreds of variations based on the algorithm and how many it would spit out. So you can all have individualized business cards and yet still have a really sharp and beautiful identity, right? So, you know, this would always be recognizable as the MIT brand, but it came, you know, in variations, a lot, a lot of variations. Same is true of, of some physical design, too. So, um, the, uh, this, this back here is a partition that was done with generative design by Autodesk. And by generative design, they basically set an algorithm uh, up and they said, uh, make a partition for us that's going to be lighter weight, and that is easily, you know, manufactured, um, you know, in terms of additive manufacturing, uh, that we can then turn around to, I think, Boeing is their, their partner on this. So Autodesk uh, put their software to work and made uh, this. And they made it without a designer or an engineer. They just said, you know, go to town, do this. Um, it spit out, you know, hundreds of different designs, and they ended up choosing this one. Autodesk has a number of other uh, um, design-like uh, parts and pieces that are being automated as well. So they can uh, 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 set up a set of parameters in some of their software and have uh, the software create a multitude of layouts for how a room might be laid out. And so you're starting to take care of some of the interior design aspects in an automated fashion. And of course, Big Dog <laughs> can open a door. Um, and if Big Dog can open a door, uh, we're going to start to see uh, some other algorithms and some other AIs and some other uh, automated tools begin to do some of our design work at the very tactical level. Um, possibly even a Roomba cleaning up my designs. Can you guys tell that it's a Roomba? Is that clear? No? No laughs? Okay, cool. <laughs> All right. So, um, this is good news, though, okay? And I'll just read these. So, that's hard to read from this angle. The need for social and emotional skills, including initiative-taking leadership, will rise a bit. And that's a really important thing. So these are things to think about in terms of, of upskilling yourself. Uh, creativity is also going to be highly in demand. The question of, of how you apply that creativity, what you do with it. Okay, demand for advanced technological skills, such as coding, is going to rise by 55% in 2030. Developers in the room, any? Or people who code who are designers? Keep your hands raised. Okay, cool. So you're probably going to be okay, but there's going to be things that are going to be automated. Um, and then retraining is a huge imperative. Getting people to be retrained in their skills so that they can move up is going to be really, really, um, really important. And I'll talk a bit about globalization, which I'm going to unpack, uh, sort of uh, talk about uh, globalization from four uh, perspectives, sort of outsourcing, right, which is I'm going to provide uh, a company uh, the ability to do some of the work for us, right? Outsourcing that work, uh, in-housing, which is bringing those organizations or bringing an organization into your own organization in order to get that same kind of work done. Uh, the idea of democratization and the idea of diversity. Those are a little more loosely joined, but bear with me. So, uh, from a, an offshoring perspective, there are certain countries who are sort of leading the way, and Poland's sort of right up there. Um, um, but I think that a, a, a very interesting aspect of this is China, okay? And what we're seeing in China is that there are currently 17 million designers in China. And they're sending out a half a million of them a year, according to the stats that we've got. 
And what does this mean for uh, us as designers for the rest of the world? So with this idea of globalization, with the idea of, of designers coming into the market at, at a fairly high rate, um, you know, uh, it's a supply and demand thing. And so what you're going to see is the costs of hiring designers might drop because they're able to go to a place like China and get some design work happening. Um, in housing. So as far as in housing goes, um, and uh, we do this, right? So McKinsey buys organizations. But what you'll see in this chart is uh, starting on the left in 2011, moving to the right in 2016, and the, the, the trend continues. Uh, the companies listed on the left are companies that were prominent in the information that I looked at in order uh, of you know, people who are buying companies, who are bringing design firms or design-driven firms into their own organizations in order to beef up and enhance design. Now, this can be super positive for you. Like, if you own a design company, design consultancy right now, and you haven't been approached by some major organization who wants to, uh, to bring you in, um, and th by the way, the, the ones that I list, um, you know, are, are uh, progressive or digitally progressive companies, right? So the Googles, the Facebooks of this world, uh, and then the consultancies have generally followed suit. Um, but I think the incumbents are going to start to really think about this as well. Every uh, large client and large organization that, that we talk to at McKinsey um, is, tends to be generally very, very interested in having uh, greater design capabilities, and we're happy to help to build those up with them. But one of the things that you notice um, when you start to look at uh, offshoring and, and, uh, and some of these other aspects is that you get what Alan Cooper calls the invasion of the lightweights. Uh, you run into this a little bit uh, where you have all these free and lovely wonderful tools, but that doesn't necessarily make you a good problem solver or a good designer. Right? You can crank something out that looks like a UI right? because it, it is polished. Right? It's using templates that you've gotten and icons that you've you pull together, and because the people sort of know how to use the tools, uh, they're, they're able to put together something that, that looks like it functional and looks like it works. Um, but some of these folks are a little less competent and capable at uh, digging into the real problem solving, digging into the user research, and really understanding sort of how to solve the problem in, as it relates to, um, as it relates to uh, the, des the user's needs. Okay. And there's this other idea, which is uh, democratization of design. So uh, my opinion is that regardless of whether you're a product manager or an engineer or a designer, uh, you're a designer, right? Anybody who's responsible for making anything is sort of a designer already. We've gotten away from that a little bit, but for the most part, uh, we're, we're all designers. We all are you know, intent on uh, designing things, OK? Now, um, when this happens, right, when sort of we recognize that everyone's a designer, again, people are coming in and they're doing some of the things that you might have done in the past. Uh, and if it's automated, there, you know, some tools cranking out the wireframes. But if it's a, a, a business analyst, let's say at McKinsey, and they're relatively comfortable beginning to crank out wireframes, and that, that can happen. And that's OK. Um, we don't really think it's a problem necessarily to democratize what we do, but it does shift things around for us. OK, um, so here's another uh, set of stats. Um, diversity, as far as diversity goes. Uh, we don't do a good job in tech or in design of necessarily being very inclusive of uh, folks who are, um, 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 who are not like us, who are not necessarily you know, white dudes. Um, it's a problem, OK? Google is 60% white and 31% Asian, and then they, you know, lump 9% for everybody else. So you end up with people like that guy Daymore out of Google a couple of months back who is raising a big stink and being sort of an asshole. 45% um, uh, of designers are female, but they often don't have leadership roles in the organizations that they're in, uh, and that's not cool. So you end up with, and this is uh, given a while back, but you end up with this Carolyn Davidson Okay, who was paid thirty-five dollars for the Nike logo, the Nike logo, originally? Now they later compensated her with a lot more stock, right? They they recognized her eventually, but originally when she came in to do this, Phil Knight, who's the founder of, of Nike, gave her thirty-five bucks. Here you go, right? And it's iconic. It's it's you know one of the most recognizable symbols on the planet. Okay, 
Conversely, right, when, when Paul Rand was brought in by Steve Jobs to design the Next logo for uh, Jobs' company Next after Apple, he was paid 100 grand. And it was like, you don't ask questions. It's Paul Rand. Give me $100,000. I'm not even going to get out of bed for less than $100,000. Uh, he says it in a video I found. It's, it's really funny. So he presents this thing. He shows it. He says, and here it is, and you know, that's why you paid me $100,000. Now, Paul Rand will say, and a lot of designers will say, you're not paying me $100,000 for the, you know, let's say, the 10 minutes it took me to crank out this logo. And by the way, I'm, I actually think that Carolyn's work <laughs> is much better than this next logo, but that's neither here nor there, okay? Uh, but what, what uh, Rand would say is that you're paying me for the, you know, the 35 years prior to this that I learned the craft of design. So you're paying me for my experience. Um, but paying a dude for his experience and paying a woman the, the same rate is, uh, is not really there yet. So diversity is sort of an issue. Now when we get more diversity, when we bring more folks into design and into development and into some of these tech companies, we're going to have an even greater number of people, which adds to essentially the glut of the supply, which will essentially, again, reduce the amount of, uh, of design or, or reduce design sort of um, costs. So what do we do about it? Okay. Um, let me just unpack this. There's some good news. One of the pieces of good news is that this talk is maybe halfway over and beers are, are imminent. That's a good thing. I can't wait for one. I'm, I'm a little bit parched. Um, most of the companies we speak with, and I, I, I said this a moment ago, but most of the companies that we speak with, um, and McKinsey deals with quite a lot of, of clients, and a lot of incumbents and large organizations, are hungry for design. They want design. Um, so on that chart that I showed you earlier where uh, firms like my own are buying other design firms or design firms, uh, what you're going to see is, is I think this is going to happen with some of these incumbents. So larger organizations who haven't had design or haven't had very sophisticated design in the past are going to start bringing them in. And Google and Amazon and Facebook are all still uh, acquisitive, and they're also still looking for more design on top of the designers that they have. So they're, they might have a bunch of designers, but they're hiring more, and they're still doing that. So the trend continues up, okay? And good news for design in general um, this is a chart that I bust out quite a bit, uh, but it's the uh, Design Management Institute's uh, Design Value Index, which tracks a number of different companies that the Design Management Institute identified as being um, design-driven back in 03, and they tracked them against the S&P 500, and they found that they did better. Uh, there's also a lot of information behind the slide. I suggest you look it up and take a deep read. Uh, you know, Apple and Starbucks being on this list have probably inflated the numbers a bit, but it's still positive on the, uh, the positive side. And the media is all over design still, right? So uh, concepts like design thinking, um, you know, uh, famous designers like Johnny Ive are all being sort of pictured and, and floated around as, as things. And so when I first started in 94, it was a way uphill battle to get anywhere close to where we are today in terms of designers having a seat at the table uh, design is being recognized for the quality and the, and the work that they do. And so generally things are positive. And as I said earlier, everything is designed, but not everything is designed well. Now this is a sort of a, a, an obtuse example, a very gross example. There's a woman uh, named Katarina Comprani. She's an artist. Uh, wonderful work. Super great work. She does these designs that are specifically unusable. So if I took these rain boats out in the rain, you know, they'd fill up with water and they, it would be a waste of time. She's got a fork that has uh, the end and the tines and the very end on the other side, the sort of the, and like a chain in the middle. So you, you'd pick it up and it would just flop around, it wouldn't do anything. Her work is really lovely and fun. Um, now, and again, the positive thing is uh, design is recognized. So when things are designed well, they're lovely and beautiful and emotional, right? So, you know, here's an example of of a set of Lego ads, there's a, a bunch more of these, where the, uh, the Legos being essentially viewed with, through the eyes of a child, and a child's imagination gives even a you know, blocky set of Legos life. So it's just a very compelling advertisement for Lego. Um, but good design can be really, really moving and really, really emotional. So what do we need to do about it? We need to evolve or die. And let's unpack this a little bit. So uh, remember this model of design complexity? 
uh, we need to move up this pyramid. We need to really stop thinking about the very, very specific, not stop. We need to continue to think about the tactical aspects of design, but we need to incorporate uh, the more uh, robust and substantial aspects of design, thinking about the behaviors and the experiences of design. Okay, We need to think about um, how we incorporate a greater user experience into the application we're developing. What is the what are the user's needs and how do we sort of get at that, right? Because, like I said, we're all designers. Uh, this is a, a, a designer, his name is Victor Papanak, and the book here is Design for the Real World. I, I strongly urge you to read this as well. Um, but his thing is that everyone's a designer, okay? Um, you know, when we used to run around in tribes of 150 people on the savanna, uh, you, you pretty much had to be a designer pretty much or you didn't survive, right? You would make your own tools, your own clothes. Uh, you would do the hunting. You would uh, build your, your shelter. Everyone was like building and designing together. It was a much more uh, robust mindset. Um, and though you know, people uh, uh, evolve as well, right? People have evolved from, from where we were to, to where we are today. Today, the design you do is a little bit more um, about the things you choose. Right? So you might not be a designer. You might be an accountant. And that person's not necessarily a designer, but you do choose the clothing that you wear, and you do choose the watch that you own, and you do choose the car that you drive. So there are aesthetic choices being made by these kinds of folks. Um, so everything evolves. Our tools evolve. Okay. Uh, so if that tribe of, of 150 people was running around and the stone tool was the best they had at the time, uh, now I can go get uh, the Swiss Army knife, and it's got you know quite a few different ways of doing things. It's, it's a really robust tool. So our tools evolve. Uh, our games evolve. Right? We had Pong in 1975 or whatever. It's Nolan Bushnell uh, uh, designed and built Pong. And so we had a version of Pong on our TV set. And it was super fun. Right? It's also super pixelated and super simple. Uh, this screenshot, and I don't know, I'm not a gamer anymore. I'm just on time for it. Uh, but the screenshot's from a game on, on, on the right here, and, and uh, it is nearly indistinguishable from a photograph. Uh, and the interactions and the movements are getting smoother and smoother. Okay? Um, businesses evolve. Okay? We didn't know that taxis are broken until Uber fixed them. And who would have thought about it, right? Like, you get in a taxi, you pay the taxi, and they take you where you want to go, and great. You're good to go. But with the advent of, of mobile technologies and, and the ability for uh, uh, a two-way communication between those, uh, those applications, a driver who's driving their own car uh, and has signed up with the service can come pick me up exactly where I am. And I can call the service to me. Additionally, I don't have the friction of having to pay the driver anymore. It's really funny. I don't take taxis all that often, uh, but occasionally I do. Usually when I, I get to an airport, uh, and then I'm going to a place, I usually take a taxi because they're all sitting right there. I don't have to wait another you know, 10 or 12 minutes or whatever for the Uber to show up. And some cities don't have Uber. Um, so what I love is that, oh, time out? Am I running out on time? Oh, how much time do I have left? I have to wrap it up. Okay, well, let's move along. Uh, uh, what Uber didn't really account for is the tax and medallions in, in some of the cities that we're looking at are approaching zero and or the people who own these tax medallions are in major debt. So the, the folks at Uber really didn't think about this and that's sort of problematic. Okay? Uh, not only do our interfaces evolve, um, but our interfaces are getting a great deal more immersive. Some of our interfaces have names and we're starting to get to know them. I've got an Alexa in my kitchen. Uh, I don't use Siri that much. It doesn't seem to work very well for me and I've seen Watson uh, beat the pants off some people on Jeopardy. Uh, companies evolve or not. Right? Netflix uh, pretty much ate Blockbuster's lunch. It used to be a Blockbuster in every corner, uh, not dissimilar to Starbucks in the US anyway. Uh, some companies uh, who were at the top of their game and the top of the world, uh, the technology has shifted and, and are in dire straits or have found a, a small niche to sort of uh, live in. So specifically, what can we do? Don't panic. Okay, There's opportunity in a crisis. You drop an egg on the ground, just an egg. And there's things to deal with it. Read. Read voraciously. Take the time out of your day to learn and to read material and to get an in-depth knowledge of the business that you're in or 
the field that you're working on or anything. The more you read as a designer and the more you read of different varied things, the better you're a designer you're going to be. Okay? Learn. Here's a list of things to learn as a designer, um, some of which I think we talked about earlier today, but things like uh, the business that you're in is a great thing to go learn. Understanding the financial implications of the work that you're doing and why the product you're selling might make a buck or not, uh, that's a really good set of things to learn. Okay? Uh, learn about storytelling. Learn to think about how you're conveying information. We learned this from uh, Tom Griever's presentation just now. He's talking about you know, articulating design. You learn how to convey that information. The whole idea of, of, of uh, the term soft skills, I think, is bullshit, right? It's a misnomer. I think that soft skills are hard, but that doesn't mean you can't learn how to do those things, okay? Write. So my friend Molly Steenson, she writes quite a bit. She's a very pro prolific writer. Uh, here's her book. Uh, I haven't read it yet. I haven't had a chance. Uh, but I guarantee you it's going to be a good read because uh, sh the way she writes is amazing. Uh, you should also learn to write. Write on Medium. Write anywhere. Write all the time. Even if, if whatever you use it for is writing a good email or writing a good communication with a client, it's a really important thing. Um, get to know your users. Get out from behind your computer and get down in the street, okay, and learn what they're doing, okay? Um, learn what they need. Learn how to uh, fix whatever their problems are and learn how to apply those problems to and align those problems with whatever the business problem is that you're trying to solve. It's Bill Moggridge. Um, there's no such thing as secondhand empathy. This is sort of related to this notion of getting out and talking with people. Here's an example of, and I was going to go into a longer story of this, but I showed up and did some contextual inquiry, research where you show up in a person's house for a product that I was designing while I was at Frog for a large um, uh, manufacturer of medical devices. In this case, it was type 2 diabetes. We showed up in this house, and the idea was to try to learn about uh, this. This uh, it was the father, but we ended up interviewing the whole family and what he was going through in terms of his type 2 diabetes. And what we found instead was the house was in squalor. It was tragic. And the problems were a lot more deep-seated than just the fact that this guy had type 2 diabetes. So, you know, the things that we could do to solve his problem in terms of, of the application of the physical device that we were de uh, designing and developing, uh, you know, could have translated into some of the things we were doing, but suffice to say, their problems were a lot greater. But seeing the problems gave us a much better understanding of how we were trying to solve our problem. Um, you know, if possible, you have the ability to design anything, right? The tools are available to you that you can go design anything. So if it's worlds within uh, the Marvel Universe, or if it's AR, VR, uh, you can design quite a bit. And those are in need, right? Those aren't sort of the, I don't consider those the tactical levels. I don't consider those like the wireframes of the websites. Uh, designing a world requires a, a great deal more uh, rich engagement with that world. So um, I describe uh, this model of complexity, and I talk about this notion of, of there are companies that are design conscious. Uh, I've got a couple of them. I'll zip through my slides because I'm running out of time. I'm almost done. Yeah, I'm almost done. Okay. All right. Um, but at the very top of the pyramid are uh, systems and organizations, uh, policies. Okay. So you want to design things like uh, systems. Okay. So for Musk, it's uh, you're thinking about not only the the roof to the house, but the solar panels that go on the roof and how those solar panels could be incorporated into the tiles of the roof because this is what he's doing with Solar City. You brought Solar City into Tesla, it's now part of Tesla, and you're going to give uh, Powerwall to do battery storage of, of the energy you're drawing from the roof, and you're going to drive a Tesla car. So he's thinking systemically. Uh, I'm not saying everyone here can be Elon Musk, but by all means, you know, try to, try to design for systems. Uh, try to design for diversity, okay? So uh, this, this was never a dress. It was always a cape, okay? Uh, that's not strictly true of the original designer who designed it, but this is this brilliant little response to the fact that, you know, like, we should empower women to go do stuff. So design for diversity. Make things more diverse. When you are looking to hire on at a company, ask how many women there are on the team. Ask how many women there are at the company, all right? And, and if they don't even have a goal for a more diverse uh, workplace, you should consider working someplace else. McKinsey's goal for diversity for women, specifically, is uh, what we call 50-50 by 2020. And what that means is half women employees 
by 2020. So it's a goal. I'm not sure we're going to reach it, but we're trying, right? And so if a company that you're talking to is not trying or the company you're in is not trying, maybe you should go someplace else. Uh, Disney thinks in systems as well. Uh, this is one of my favorite slides. They, uh, they tend to um, uh, be acquisitive as well. They bought my childhood. Uh, so this is all stuff that I grew up on, uh, and now they just own it all. They also think systemically. So this is Disney's magic band. Uh, if you go to the Florida version of Disneyland, I think believe they're still prototyping. If they spent a billion dollars to try to reduce the frictions that you have in the park, some of the ones that I was talking about earlier today, the standing in lines and the everything else, with a physical device that you just get in the mail before you show up at Disney and wear, get to keep, and it you know solves problems for you like you know checking you into restaurants, getting you in lines, and and moving you through the system that is Disneyland and that experience. Uh, learn to draw. Anyone can. If you draw like you did when you were six, that's okay. This woman, Betty Edwards, has written this book, Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain. Go buy it. It will help you to draw better. Uh, someone earlier was talking about uh, the person who gets up to the whiteboard is the person who sort of can control the room. If you're able to get up to the whiteboard and communicate with drawings, and they can be very simple ones, uh, you're in much better shape to not only be uh, more empowered to do your job, but uh, also just to communicate and to, and to control the, the narrative, okay? Um, design for politics this is my friend Mike. Uh, Mike is uh, very focused on thinking about how uh, the current political climate in, in the United States, which is where I'm from, um, has sort of turned for the worse. I'm not gonna get too political in, in this talk right now, but he's written a couple of great books. So by all means, read Design as a Job and You're My Favorite Client. That will help you to understand your place as a designer generally. Um, teach and mentor and nurture. This particular slide is a photograph from when my kid was in kindergarten. She was already learning about design thinking. It's really, really, really cool. I get to sort of like see what she thought of design through her eyes. Um, pretty amazing. So by all means, teach and mentor. Uh, you can learn a lot from the people that you teach, and you can learn a lot from the people that you mentor. Uh, my last slide. Um, don't bother designing a f another photo app. <laughs> There's quite a few out there. If you're working on one right now, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't mean to be disparaging of the app that you're working on. I'm sure it's awesome, but there's a lot of photo apps. There's a lot of uh, um, uh, applications out there that are doing essentially the same thing with maybe some incre incremental improvements. You should probably work on something that's a little bit more in depth. Thank you very much. And I'll jump to my last set of slides. I had a bunch more. Bump. Thank you.